our study on the matter of church cooperation. Now, I know tonight's the third Sunday. I'm supposed to be singing tonight, but I put it in the bulletin because of uh, because of the interest that's been generated. I didn't want two weeks in between our study. Plus, we have a tendency the longer it goes, the more we forget uh, what we've studied. And so I uh, want to just do that this week. Lord willing, then next week we'll have our regularly uh, scheduled monthly singing. But uh, looking at the matter of church cooperation, and uh, by the way, I mentioned this in the bulletin uh, that I did not announce it. On the table in the back are several copies of this book called A Church Divided uh, by Brother Wayne Jackson. It was written, I think, in about the year 2000, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know if I can find it. Yes, yeah, 2000. And uh, uh, I picked up, it used to be a lot different format than this, but I've got about 10 copies on the table and back. It deals with the four primary issues. As you can see, it's a very brief book, uh, but it deals in a very uh, brief and cursory way with the four issues that we'll study in this series of studies that are related to the non-institutional or the anti-movement uh, because not all of the things that have to do with non-institutionalism or with, uh, with, uh, with anti-movement have to do with what was known as institutionalism. Uh, there are other matters such as eating in the church building and, and things of that nature that we'll get to eventually. But uh, if you'd like a copy of this, you can pick one up on the back table. Again, I'll ask you, only take one copy and only take it if you're going to read it. And uh, I can get more copies if I need to. Uh, these are on an as-needed basis. They don't keep them in print. Uh, I just call uh, Jared Jackson up in Jackson, Tennessee, and tell him I need copies, and, and they print them as needed. So we can get them as as we need them. But uh, I, I've been using I've been using this book uh, as a kind of as a guide for my my thought process. Now a more in-depth study. Uh, that is very helpful is Thomas Warren's Lectures on Church Cooperation and Orphan Homes. This is a very good book, uh, but uh, it's a lot harder to read than Brother Jackson's book. Wayne Jackson had a, a gift to write in a very concise and effective way. It was very readable. Brother Warren, not so much. What's wrong? Camera's up too high. Camera's up too high. Oh, I see what happened. All right, there we go. How's that? I don't know. It ain't come through yet. Well, check it now. Now, now, it's, not, now it's too low because I'm in it. <laughs> but uh, Brother Warren is a lot more difficult to read. Uh, he's a, a tremendous magician, uh, just a great mind. And, uh, but, uh, but there's some really good material, and I'm going to walk you through some of that material tonight. To give you an idea of how logical, Brother Warren is probably most well known for a debate that he held in 1976 at, I believe it was at North Texas State University, where he debated renowned atheist Anthony Flew on the existence of God. And uh, Brother Warren uh, did an incredible job in that, in that debate uh, about uh, the existence of, of God. And, uh, and by the way, at the end of his life, uh, 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 Anthony Flew uh, gave up his atheism. I'm not saying that he embraced New Testament Christianity, uh, but at the end of his life, he did embrace he did embrace the idea that that God had to exist for basically everything to exist. And so, and you cannot underestimate the power or the effectiveness of what Warren had done in that debate all those years ago. And by the way, when Flew did that, all of his uh, former friends just savaged him. I mean, they absolutely savaged him over his profession and the belief uh, in God. But anyway, this is a good book, and I think this book is still in print, and you can get, you can get a copy of, of this book as well. And so we're looking at the matter of the sponsoring church, and we noted that this, uh, this probably came into, well, it, it came into prominence in the 1950s, particularly with the, uh, with the uh, beginning of the Herald of Truth uh, radio program begun in about 52, and then the Herald of Truth TV program that was started, I believe, in 1956 and was overseen by the Brethren in Abilene, Texas. Uh, I think it might have been the Highland Church in Abilene, Texas, and many of us, that, that, that if, you're, if you're as old as I am, 
You probably remember seeing Basil Barrett Baxter on television at some point in time on Herald of Truth. And that was their program. And brethren all over the country uh, contributed to that program because the gospel was being preached in, for example, you know, as I said, it was on, I believe it was on channel 12. It was either on channel 12 or channel 6. There's only two channels I had growing up. And, but Brother uh, 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 Baxter was on one of those uh, channels each and every week with the Herald of Truth program. And Brethren opposed the program on the basis that one church could not send money to another church to help preach the gospel. And there are still Brethren, again, in our area and, and, and in other places uh, that still hold to that position that, that churches cannot send money uh, to one another to, to preach or to assist in the preaching of the gospel, and there are obviously there are a number of there are a number of logical difficulties uh, with this. And what I want you to understand is is that um, well, first that most of the people that I have talked with that oppose what is known as the sponsoring church concept have no idea how it works. <laughs> have no idea how it works. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, when uh, Johnny and Darlene Palmer first moved into this area, they were of that persuasion. And I spent a lot of time when my office was back there in that corner studying with, with them, particularly with Darlene. And as I began to explain to her how, that, how the sponsoring church uh, functioned, she said, that's not what I was taught at all. That's not what I was told at all. And, and so, and not that she was automatically convinced that it was right, but what she understood was that she hadn't been told what was right about it. Now, if you saw the bulletin this morning, you saw that I've, I've been in a conversation with another brother in a state a long way from here who called me, contacted me, and then eventually called me when I was going to St. Louis last week, and we talked for about an hour about some of these matters, and, and the same thing happened. He told me. When I explained to him how the sponsoring church system worked, he said, if it is as you say, and, you know, it, it, and he wasn't being accusative, he's a really, really jovial, amiable guy. And he said, if it is as you say, then, then, then you, you wouldn't receive the, all the, the, the pushback that you did. And I said, well, I can assure you, being a member of what is known as mainstream churches for over 40 years, Worshiping with churches that have been sponsoring churches and supporting churches, I can tell you that the way I've described it is exactly the way that it is. You know, in different states and different congregations, the way I'm describing it is exactly the way it is. And then, and he said, he said that that he understood, but he had not been properly informed. And at other times, he had indicated that he had uh, he had made inquiry of brethren who couldn't defend the sponsoring church concept. And so it's just kind of a, well, well, we'll just agree to disagree. But there was no real study. And so he was appreciative that somebody actually wanted to sit down and talk to him and explain uh, the situation. And, uh, and so uh, there's still a lot of interest. There's still a lot of interest in this. But in Brother Warren's book, in Brother Warren's book, in, in his uh, lecture on the matter of church cooperation, he says, in essence, he says, it is right for a church to send money to another church for the preaching of the gospel. Now, he said it in a lot more words than that, as Brother Warren was prone to do. But he quoted some brethren from the non-institutional movement who opposed church cooperation in preaching the gospel. And he says, and he quotes one of them here, he says, this is the, this is the non-institutional brother. Evangelizing the world is another kind of church work. This work has been assigned by the Lord to all the churches, and therefore they are all equally related to this obligation and responsibility. The Bible does not contain one verse of Scripture authorizing a church to send a donation to another church for this kind of work, the work of evangelism. In other words, he says there's not one verse anywhere in the New Testament that speaks of a church sending money to another church for the preaching of the gospel. Now, that statement is true. That statement is true. You don't see any verse specifically that says one church sent money to another church for the preaching of the gospel. But do you remember from this, this morning about our syllogism? 
When you begin with a faulty premise, you end up with a faulty conclusion. And in this case, the faulty premise is that everything has to be explicitly spelled out in the New Testament for it to be authorized. And that no other principle can be applied. And so let's look at this, let's look at this from, from, from that vantage point. That there is no verse that, that shows that one church sent money to another church for the purpose of preaching the gospel. But let's, let's look at some, some other principles that are involved. And you can, you can write these, you can put these in, uh, for example, in your notebook. Uh, uh, and by the way, Brother, uh, Brother uh, Jackson, on page 5 of his book, makes an, uses an example... And it's an example that is almost identical to one in which we are currently engaged. Brother Jackson makes a note, says, Several years ago, there was a small congregation in Nevada consisting solely of a few women. They were faithful to the Lord and desiring to spread the gospel. Could a more prosperous church have forwarded funds to these Christians to help them purchase tracts or other teaching materials for use in their town. Our non-institutional brothers say, no, they cannot. That, group of, that, that small group of women just has to muddle and struggle along the very best they can because one church can't send money to them to help them preach the gospel. Now, there are a number of questions that I would have to ask. If you can't spend money or if you can't send money from one church to another church to preach the gospel, for example, to buy tracts or pay a preacher, now, could one, they would say that you can't send money to that church to pay for them to have a preacher. I guess a woman has to preach. Every, you know, as, but if they can't find a man that can preach, then a woman will have to preach. Well, if the assembly is only women, I guess... All you've got is all you've got. But what if what if a congregation could send some support to them to help them find a preacher? Take up support of a preacher. Again, our non-institutional brothers say that cannot be done. But then I'll ask this question. If I can, if, if what to say, and by the way, what we're doing is with the church in Pahrump, in Pahrump, Nevada. In Nevada here and Nevada for us. That church has just a handful of members. And on any given Sunday, there may only be one man present. He has to do it all. He has to do it all. Now, they're doing well. And by the way, the man that basically does everything does it without any financial remuneration from the church. Now, can we send money to that church to help them buy tracts? Yes. We can. But if we can't, as our non-institutional brethren say, could we buy the tracks and mail them to them? And if we, if we can, then what is the difference of whether we buy them and mail them or we send the money to them and they buy it? Is there any distinction between those two things? It's the same thing, isn't it, Shannon? It's the same, it's the same thing. In fact, it is more expedient to do it that way that, that, than to add steps to the process. Why not just why not just streamline the process and you end up with the same thing? What about this? Open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Again, our brethren of the non-institutional persuasion would say that the Burleson Church could not send money to the church in Pahrump to pay a preacher to preach the gospel there. In Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas 
to go as far as Antioch. Now the church at Jerusalem, what did they send? They sent a man to go to Antioch to preach. Which means they supported him, in, at least in some way, would have accepted at least some form of support to su get him to Antioch to help him preach the gospel there. Does that make sense? So you can take money and send a man to Antioch, but you can't take money and send it to Antioch for them to get a man. Now that, that's, that's the position that it's taken. How is, it, how is it that a church can, send, can take their own funds and send a man from point A to point B to preach the gospel, but can't send money from point A to point B for them to get somebody to preach the gospel? What is the end, what, is the end result the same? Is the purpose the same? <coughs> is the money being used for exactly the same thing yes. to preach the gospel? It is. And so you, you see the difficulties involved. You see the difficulties involved when you say that a church can't do a certain thing and they do almost they do basically the identical same thing, they do it in a different way. But that's fine. But for but again, for some reason it's all it always comes back to the money. It always comes back to the money. But the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas. By the way, then Barnabas went and found Saul. <laughs> You know, Saul was, you know, Saul had already gone up back to Tarsus, and he brought Saul back there in verse 25, and he brought him to Antioch. And they assembled uh, uh, with the uh, church there and taught a great many people. So we see that a church can send, I mean, we would believe that a church could send Bible literature to another church. A church could send a preacher to another church, but the church can't send that same money to another church for the exact same purpose. You, I mean, you, do you see the difficulty involved in that kind of thinking? Now, I want to show you show you something from. I want to show you something for, uh, and I, I'm going to come back to Brother uh, Jackson's book in just a moment. But I want I want to show you something here with regard to with regard to the the sponsoring church concept and the difficulty. Now this, this, by the way, this is not an example or an illustration that's fictional. This actually happened. Okay, this actually happened. <coughs> Brother Warren says two congregations in the same town, each had its own television program, and one of the preachers loaned the other preacher some chalk. I guess he might have had some kind of blackboard or you know. On for his TV program. One preacher, preacher A, loaned preacher B some chalk to help him out with his program. The second preacher opposes church cooperation in matters of evangelism. And during a debate in which preacher B was involved, it was pointed out to him that if preacher A can use chalk bought by Church A and be given to Church B and Preacher B, the same money that can be used to buy chalk is the same money that can be used to buy Bible class literature and help them preach the gospel. Is that right? What's the difference in, what's the difference in a man receiving a piece of chalk bought by another church and receiving money to buy his own chalk from another church. There is none, is there? By the way, <laughs> Preacher B was so disturbed by the accusation that he actually went over and paid that other guy some money for the chalk. Went over and paid that guy some money for the chalk. You see? That's right. Could Barnabas share his support with Saul? If Barnabas is being supported by the church at Jerusalem and he goes and he gets Saul and brings him back, could, you know, could, could Barnabas help Saul? Well, obviously he could. And so, but you, again, you see, you see the difficulties involved 
when you start trying when you start trying to bind things that the Lord has not has not bound. Now I want to note one more thing. I want to note one more thing, and this is from this is also from um, uh, Brother Jackson, and this goes back to the matter. This goes back to the matter of one church helping another church. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8. He said, I robbed other churches taking wages from them. Right. Open your Bible to that passage. I robbed other churches taking wages from them. All right? 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8. Second Corinthians 11 verse 8. Because I haven't read you the whole verse. I robbed other churches taking wages from them. For what purpose? That I might, what? Minister to you. Now, question. Who was the real recipient of the wages? The ones that were ministered to. That's exactly right. It's like in verse 24 of the chapter 11 you're talking about. When the barnabas was sent, you know, they said that he was a, said, well, he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and the faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. And the, the goal was that thought was for people to be added to the Lord. The goal was for people to be added to the Lord. Yes. So again, the preaching of the gospel. And so, and so that church sent Barnabas for the what? The purpose of what? Adding people to the Lord. Paul received wages from other churches, but who was the beneficiary? The church at Corinth was. Yeah, the hearers at Corinth. And by the way, not just non-Christians, not just non christian not just the preaching of the gospel to non-Christians, because Paul said that I might minister to you. That I might minister to you, talking about the church. And so again, what principle? What principle would be violated if, rather than sending Paul or helping Paul, that they just they helped the church at Corinth and they had and they had a preacher? You see, there, there's as one old preacher said, that's a difference without a distinction. <laughs> and so the the two thing, the two things are the same. And the sponsoring con and the sponsoring church concept, again, is an expedient. It is an expedient. It is the most efficient way to accomplish a thing. For a lack now, or a need. Sir? For a lack or a need. That's right. For a lack or a need. Now, one thing that uh, Brother uh, uh, Warren mentioned with regard to church cooperation. I have to carry this with me so I can get. I want, and that may that may not show up, but I want it just in case. Now, Brother Warren says, "Here's Church A, all right, and here's Church B." It's now here is radio station. The radio station has a set time from 9 to 9.30 every day, Sunday to Saturday. Now, can Church A buy that radio, or buy that radio time? Yes. They can. Can they buy some of it? Can they buy Monday, Wednesday, you know, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Yes. Okay. Right. Can church B buy the other time? Yes. They can. Right. But what if church A signs a contract 
purchases all the time. Does that mean that Church B can't that Church B can't preach on the radio now? Can Church B assist Church A in preaching the gospel from nine to nine thirty? Now, who has oversight? Who has oversight of the time? Church A has oversight of the time. Correct. Can Church B help? Again, our brother, our other brothers say no. They cannot help. Them. They cannot help them. Right. But if you cannot help them, if you cannot help them, what if preacher, what if preacher A gets sick? Can preacher B fill in for him? Can the elders? At, can can the elders here? Here's preacher A. He's sick. Can the elders at church A call the other preacher and say, "Look, Tom's sick." He can't preach for the rest of this week. Can you come and preach for us on this radio program this week? Can he do that? He can. And our non-institutional brethren would affirm that he can. Would affirm that he can. Who's paying church? Who's paying preacher baby? Hey. No, they're not. Well, I mean, church does. Who's paying preacher B? Church B is paying preacher B. Is that right? But preacher B is helping church A preach the gospel. Does that make, do you see where I'm going with this? In other words, the second church can provide a man to help preach the gospel on the radio program, but they can't help that church by the time. It does make sense. That's what I'm, that's why that's why I'm illustrating this for you. To show the difficulties that are involved that are, that are involved when you start binding what God has not bound. And, and what it is, what you end up finding is is that you can do, that they will affirm that you can do essentially the exact same thing as long as you do it their way, you'll be all right. But if you do it another way, you're wrong. You're wrong. All right, so this shows that Church B can cooperate with Church A in any number of ways in preaching the gospel on the radio. They can, they can allow their preacher, they can allow their preacher to, 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 be on, to be on the program. Or they can help Church A pay the expense to preach the gospel in that town. Or they can do both. But who has control over the programs? Church A has it. The church that signed the contract has control over the program. They control who preaches. And they control what is preached. In other words, if somebody got on, let's just say for some reason preacher B got on and he, and he preached error. Well, then church A, what? They'll have to correct him. I have to correct But they have oversight of that work. At one time, neither church had oversight, and both could participate equally. But now church A has oversight over this. But again, according to our brother, church B is out. At least so far as this time slot is concerned. See, that, that still doesn't work. It won't work. And so... That's just one, that's just one of the examples. That's just one of the examples that uh, that Brother Warren uh, gave. And by the way, that was another that was another example of something that had uh, uh, that had actually happened. Well, let me ask you something. <laughs> Somewhere they, all these uh, non-institutional people do they use song books? They do. Where do they get the uh, authority for it? Explain that. Well, I mean, the early church, some of the Jewish churches had song books. But a song book isn't expedient. Yeah, I know that. I, I understand that. But when I was getting that, where do they get their authority to use them? Well, I don't know. You'll have to ask somebody besides me. <laughs> All right. I was just curious about that. Now, let me, let me give you one more example here. Again, this, this actually happened with the church where Brother Warren was preaching. There was a congregation that was meeting in a rented space in New Jersey. 
in the upper room of a business location, kind of like in town. You know, there are some of the places in our town have rooms that can be rented for whatever reason. They were meeting in a rented space over the top of a business. They contacted the church. They had some connection to the church where Brother Warren was preaching. They contacted the elders there and said they had an opportunity to buy a building. There was another religious group in town that was having to vacate their building. They were either moving to another location or, or whatever. And the building came up for sale. Now, can the church where, can the church where, uh, where Brother Warren preached send money to help that church buy that building? Again, our non-institutional brethren say no. <laughs> they say no. Because one church can't send money to another church to assist in the preaching of the gospel. Right? But now, suppose for just a moment, right, let's just use this as a real life example. <coughs> let's say there was a, a congregate, there was a congregation in Hackleburg that was meeting in the back of Ray's Pharmacy. All right, they don't have their own building; they're meeting in the back of Ray's Pharmacy. Now. According to our brethren, the Burleson Church could not send money to the Hackleburg Church to help them buy a building of their own. Right. But, if the brethren at Hackleburg had their own building and it got blown away by a tornado, you could send money to help them as a benevolent matter to help them rebuild the building that you couldn't help them build the first time. If the, if the church was leveled and they either didn't have sufficient insurance or didn't have any insurance, whatever it was, you couldn't help them build the building the first time as a matter of evangelism, but you could help them rebuild it the second time as a matter of benevolence, helping needy saints. Now, what's the difference in helping them build it the first time and helping them build it the second time? They were in need both times. But what, what, what's the point of having a building? It's to preach the gospel, right? Yeah, yeah. It's to assist the church in having a place to meet to preach and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some other inconsistencies that we'll talk about as we make our way, as we make our way, through, uh, as we make our way through some of these other issues. But does anybody have any questions about... Um, uh, the sponsoring church concept. Usually Phillips here, I don't, I don't, I haven't been able to look, I don't know if any questions have come in, so if you're watching and you sent a question in, I, I apologize I didn't see it, but I promise you when I get in tonight, I'll check and look and make sure uh, that we answer all any questions. By the way, you can send questions 24-7 and we'll get them. But does anybody have any questions about the sponsoring church concept, how, how it operates, how it functions, and the fact that there's authority for the sponsoring church concept. Kyle. I don't have a question, but this is what's been on my mind since we've been talking about this. And I believe it's in Philippians, and I'll, if, if I'm wrong, you'll, you'll know what I need to talk about. Uh, when Paul was, Paul said that uh, people, people had been preaching the gospel because of his bondage. Some were preaching it out of love, and some were preaching it out of, to add affliction to his chain. Right. And he said, Nevertheless, the gospel has been preached. I will rejoice because Christ is preached. And that's how kind of what comes to my mind is the gospel is being preached, yeah. and we we want to make yeah. it. That, that you'd rather not have the you'd rather not have the gospel preached. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm And I, man, when you said that, I was already you're in chat in chapter one. About verse 12. I was already way ahead of you in the end of the book in Philippians 4, where he said, No other church communicated with me concerning my needs except for you. You know, Paul talked about the church at Philippi had helped him concerning his needs. Right? And remember, this is from two weeks ago. There is only one verse in all of the New Testament that talks about a church treasury, and that's 1 Corinthians 16. And that treasury was, was, was used to help needy saints. 
The church treasury is never spoken of as being used to pay your own preacher or to support mission work, support a preacher somewhere else, or to build a building. The church treasury, but, but yet our non-institutional brethren will affirm that the church can use its treasury money to do all of those things. And so again, when when you when you lay down the you know, if you're going to start laying down the rules, then you better be prepared to live or die by the same you know by the same rules. As, you know, as Andy Griffith said, you get your britches caught on your own pitchfork, and that's what that's what we find over and over and over again. It is that they find themselves in violation of the very things that they that they condemn in others, they themselves practice in other ways. Okay? And I, and I, don't, mean to, I don't mean for that to sound ugly. I'm just stating it as, as, a, matter, as a matter of fact. All right, so now, now next week, uh, we'll, move on, um, we'll move on to the orphan's home uh, situation. Is can the church support an orphan's home uh, out of out of its treasury, and then we'll move into uh, uh, the the neat, what's called the uh, non saints benevolence for non saints. We'll move uh, to there. All right, any other questions or comments before we before we close this out? All right, appreciate everybody's good attention and, and participation.